Hello and welcome there to another episode of the Cliff Notes podcast, where we talk to industry leaders about the people, process and technology that are driving them forward. Today I've been joined by uh, Harrison Wells, VP of Professional Services at Lean DNA. Hey there, Harrison. How are you doing? Doing well. Thanks for having me. Good, good. No, it's grand. Um, thanks for being able to join us today. Um, uh, I just wanted to, to get into um, a little bit of... of uh, we're, we're, it's all about logistics. We're, we're talking uh, and so sort of supply chain and stuff today. And um, I wondered whether you could just give us a, a sense of, of, of where, where have you got into to this? Um, what, what brings the you and, and professional services um, and your, your, your current role at the moment? Yes, at, uh, at Lean DNA, we're, we're focused really on at the factory and at the buyer level. Um, obviously, uh, logistics is the, the, the final stage of, of the procurement process and, and getting material into the plant. It's also an area where there can be uh, a, a lot of uh, issues, disruptions, uh, longshoremen strikes, uh, you name it. Um, also gets into, uh, obviously, a lot of uh, INCO terms and exactly how you measure supplier performance. So those have been kind of the uh, one of the big areas that, uh, you know, how we interacted with uh, logistics. Much much in demand um, in, in the last few years of um, people sort of re-examining uh, their supply chains. I mean, it's, it's not not a thing that ever uh, sort of goes away <laughs> as wanting to approve it, but um, people have been questioning them and, and, and getting back into um, where are things coming from and am I taking things from too far away? Have I got enough stock? Where, where is it going? Um, so has it been a, an exciting time for, for you with, with working with your clients? Uh, definitely. I mean, I know there's been a lot of um, focus on, uh, you know, with the COVID situation and the and disruption in the semiconductors, you know, there was a lot of push to say, you know, there's a, a need to, to reshore and, and to rethink our supply chains. Well, I, I think that's, you know, definitely um, th there's merits to that. I mean, we, it's a supply chain should be, dis our supply base should be distributed uh, in the areas where, where you're manufacturing, uh, you know, single point of failure are always going to be dangerous. Um, you're you're never going to be you know be able to to reshore and, and to have a I, in my opinion have a real successful business model trying to go back to vertical integration and, and nationalism you know by by, by default. Um, you're you're there's always going to and even if you do even if you go say I, I want to bring everything back to, to you know reshore everything back to my country. Uh, you, there's still the domestic strikes. I mean, it, it could be, you know, uh, you, uh, here in the States, you, UPS drivers were, were dangerously close to going on strike. Uh, there's been, as I mentioned, there, there, we have the Teamsters. There, there's, there's numerous ways in logistics uh, that, uh, and, and just natural disasters and things like that, that that'll always be a threat. So, um, you know, you need, to, you, you need a strategy. You, you still have to plan on disruption. I, I think disruption's kind of the new normal. Um, if you're going to be a profitable company, you're going to have to have um, very robust uh, supply chains supported by, uh, you know, uh, world class logistics as well. And um, it's just, you know, you just need to learn to, to live in this world and, and, and manage the risk. Mm -hmm. Where do, where's your take on it? Where's your where's your um, your altitude that you you see um, that there's this space is it um that it's it's an economic level i mean is it very personal are these are these small smes talking to each other Where, where's the altitude that you tend to feel about about logistics um i think a lot of it is for, from my perspective it's more like how how do you kind of uh protect yourself uh from, from logistics i mean you know when you start looking at um you know, economic order quantities and, and things of that sort, uh, logistics costs r r really drives into that. You know, how um, you, you're trying to, um, from a plant level, you're often trying to balance your um, economic order quantity versus your economic production quantity. So the, and that's where you're kind of balancing what does it cost to place and receive a purchase order versus my holding cost. And on the manufacturing side, they're, they're, looking more at what is a, a setup cost uh, versus a holding cost. So what does it take to transition from one product line to the next? So in balancing both of those, um, you know, logistics costs is, is, a, is, a, is a big driver um, that, that you need to factor in. Um, the, yeah, I think that that's been kind of, um, as far as, you know, areas of the, the, we've been focused in, that that's been one of the, the biggest uh, impacts of logistics. 
so i mean when there's a uh, an economic level <laughs> disruption when when there's when there's pandemics when there's there's strikes or things that are happening uh, and breaking down uh, the 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 tools have still got to be there to 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 figure out well how how do we how do we bank this how do we make this still work um i mean most of the smes we work with that they have been focused on can we can we sort of shorten some of this uh, and and we we're, we're happy to see some of our clients reshoring in the sense of it does allow us some uh more business or business that's not going to be sent away so we have we are taking out some of that shipping um but there's still the supply chain and we've still got to get the raw materials into the country or into the plant so um yeah so i mean that 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 there's there's a there's a great one um to if we could go on is is where where does that come back down into um the planning and the tracking um for you is 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 there lessons that we can work on from just within our own shop within our own factory uh definitely i mean um i think a lot of it comes down to um you know what is your kind kind of your your cycle stock plan versus your uh your your, your safety stock or strategic inventory plan um you know factories are are very focused on being very lean with expensive materials so so they they're they're trying to uh, you know looking at just in time so so they're they're even trying to um, you know, almost eliminate logistics and coming up with supplier parks with, you know, conveyors actually coming, you know, across the road from the next warehouse, which is their tier one supplier. So, I mean, there's there's definitely um, focuses in that area to, to really lean their um, uh, their their supply chains for their cycle stock. The issue often comes down to what do you do when there is a disruption? Um, you know, the appetite for strategic inventory or safety stock is, is all often very is scrutinized. It's trapped capital. People aren't, aren't happy with it. But, you know, when a disruption comes, people are often saying, where is it? Um, so I, I think um, one of the concerns people have is that safety stock, unfortunately, hasn't been managed um, very well historically. It's kind of been applied in a kind of an exception basis. It's like you've had either an underperforming performing supplier or a, a logistics issue. So you start to um, stock additional material. Um, the problem is that that often isn't managed very well. You know, it, it could be years later and you'll look at the part and say, why do, why are we holding this, this buffer inventory or this extra material or, or sometimes it's buffer time, you know, they, they inflate the, the lead time of the part, which also couldn't bring it in early. Um, so, you know, you, when you start questioning it, you often find out that the historical reason that was applied has long since expired. Um, so that that's one of the reasons why when you know financial you know, when you start talking to your financial controller or the general manager they're they're very skeptical of, of safety stock. Um, so you know, Lindy has been working to to provide and other you know tools out there uh, have been working to help provide a um, a, a way of monitoring. You know, where where is your safety stock been? Uh, strategic inventory. Where have you made these investments? And how how effective is it really? Uh, is it working for you? Um, you know, for, for the for the last disruption, how many days of, of production was preserved? You know, how many days were you running below uh, your cycle stock? You were actually dipping into safety stock, but it was actually how many days of coverage were you able to protect? And so, kind of like, what was your return on investment? So, you've been making an investment. It's kind of like an insurance policy, um, and 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 how how effective has it been? You know, and then, and really, these disruptions are great learning periods, you know, you, cause you, it gives you a chance to, to test that. And, and you, after every major disruption, it's, it's a perfect time to circle back and say, okay, how many of my parts dipped into their safety stock level? How effective was it? Um, where did I run dry? Um, and where did I not even come close to tapping that, that insurance policy that I've been paying for all these years? Um, so, you know, you want to reallocate, you know, look at the areas where your investments uh, to protect yourself aren't yielding results and, and, and reallocate that to, to areas that you, you, you found yourself running up short. So I think uh, those are, you know, definitely, the, you know, the, the, the ways that you know we're we're helping manufacturers with uh, managing the disruptions. 
Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. I mean, that much similar to to a, a security system or a um, health and safety system. Um, if you're not testing and actually using it, then how do you know that you're at the right level? I mean, uh, you, if if it if it's just checked off once uh, and then you just expect, well, it's covering something. Well, if you're not using it, um, similar to stock, like you're saying, if if you're not actually using that stock, then you're just holding extra inventory you don't need. Yeah, and I think it's that 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 level of oversight that that we, and as far as an indus- industry wide, I'd say is, is is sorely lacking. There's and and until you know we we have those robust metrics and and measures and and processes in place to to say that this this is a it, this this investment's being actively managed. I think that's what it comes down to. P- people aren't there. It's kind of a set it and forget it um, t- today, and uh, you know. And, and there's no appetite for that, and, and rightfully so. Um, you know, so I, I think uh, that's definitely an area of uh, where I see, um, you know, so some new tools and, and metrics coming in place to help uh, protect supply chains from, from from all aspects of disruptions. And do you think? I mean, from from your your experience or, or where you're trying to move to is. Is that that you think that the the inventory control is 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 not so good in in different in different properties, or that um, it's the the arrangements and the planning for for what capacity do we need and what are we um, uh, and the lead times in getting that? I think um, <laughs> to be honest, I think I think people get get a little greedy. Um, it's um, it's in you know as far as. Um, when you work in supply chain, you're obviously measured on you know year over year you know savings. And when you find a, a low cost source, be it domestic or, or foreign or, or wherever it is, it's um, it's very enticing to just say, okay, let's let's reallocate our our demand, all of our demand to this, regardless of the logistics risk or or all the other factors, um, and and it's. It really sets you up uh, for for a a single point of failure in the future. Um, it ha- so, I, I really encourage people to 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 try to balance it. I mean, I know there, there's times where you can't have dual sourcing on, on everything, but when you have an existing supplier, maybe it is a domestic supplier. The, um, a lot this happens unfortunately very often. You have a, a great domestic supplier down the street, very responsive this, that, the other, all, all the advantages of, of, of a great relationship. Um, yet, you know, you can get a 20 or 30% cost reduction by, by, by going to another source. And people will move 100% of their work to, to this new source because they're trying to achieve these, you know, financial goals. Um, then a disruption happens. Um, and, and they realize, A, they, had a, they have a single point of failure. Um, they, they, they struggle with communication. They're, the engineering team is looking for, you know, quick response, um, somebody they can talk to and, and, and work design problems out with. And, and, you know, you're in multiple time zones. Sponsorship of this podcast has been brought to you by Holding Bay, the digital web agency. Holding Bay specializes in working with B2B companies like manufacturers to build better solutions and drive better sales funnels. So if you would like to build a web application or improve your branding and sales funnel, get in contact today. Holdingbay.co.uk or call us on 01273-044019. So, you know, it's really typically best to, to look at, uh, you know, working in a dual source where you, where you have a domestic uh, source um, to, to kind of deal with the fluctuations in demand. Um, so if you look at your most demand curves, uh, you, you tend to have a just kind of a spiky, you know, very, very few things are, are perfectly flat. Um, and it's those, those spikes that, you know, domestic sources are, are, are great at uh, responding to. A, you know, it's a short term, quick turn. You don't have to worry about the, the logistics uh, of, of it being on a container or, or air, air, air shipping something in to, to close a gap in a, in a demand schedule. So maintaining, you know, maybe 80, 20, 75, 25, you know, maintaining that d- domestic source. Um, yes, you're, you're, you're going to leave some money on the table, but you're going to typically more than recover that by A, being able to respond to uh, these spikes without, you know, 
very expensive logistics costs to close the gap. And you're also going to probably improve your product development cycle time by, by being closer and having those existing relationships with people that, that understand you. Is your feeling, though, that uh, potentially this is a move back towards different um, having having multiple suppliers versus just trying to consolidate everything and uh, just reduce the, uh, the overhead of, of, of trying to have relationships with different people? Um, but I mean, does that suggest that you're feeling that there is more of a need to have systems to manage it, to to be more aware of your data and, and what is available and that what you're looking at is actually what's on the floor or in the warehouse um, that's being used at the time? Yeah, definitely adds a level of complexity, you know, because you're, you're right. You can say, well, my steady state demand is going to be covered here. Um, I need to then determine and, and peel off my, my surge and, and get those that demand reallocated to another source. It definitely, I mean, that's one of the reasons why it doesn't happen. Um, ERP systems aren't often all that uh, friendly with that, um, especially if they if you have common part numbers. Um, splitting demand um, is, it isn't... Um, it isn't its forte necessarily for, from a lot of the ERP systems. So uh, it does. And um, so, yeah, there's definitely a need for some, some advancements and tools and, and processes to, to support these strategies. But today is unfortunately becomes a, a fairly, can become a fairly manual process. Um, not that we need to focus on it too much, but just to get an understanding where, where does, because you, you mentioned uh, ERPs that um, many people have, have, have or have been moving to, um, where is the overlap with with your system or where does it it, it work with an ERP if, if if a company has got an existing system like that yeah ERP systems are i mean they're 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 instrumental and and you know, lean DNA isn't looking to to replace them um they they basically you know that, that you know you when an order drops into your system it basically looks at all the warehouse locations says well, do i have the material i need to produce this order um the problem is that once after you've loaded hundreds of orders and there's thousands of parts impacted, uh, as schedules start to change, you know, you, you get a, a slip in a delivery or, or a pull ahead on an order, uh, the ERP systems create exception messages and they kind of light up like a Christmas tree pretty quickly. So as a buyer, when you come in every day, uh, you, you you can see the results of changes in schedule and you'll say, well, now this part's coming in too early. This one's coming in too late. And those are the exception messages, the pull in and push out messages. And it can it can really easily become um, daunting um, as far as just the, the sheer number. So what most companies do is they'll take um, they'll, they'll work with their ERP system. They'll export a report. They'll say, you know, plus or minus one or two days, eh, I don't care about it. Um, let's prioritize things with bigger movements that are more expensive. Um, or maybe I don't want to make adjustments on, um, you know, some, you know, parts that have logistic constraints. It's like, well, it's already on the on the shipping container. I, I can't change that schedule. So it's kind of fixed. So they, they apply a lot of rules. And then at that point, they can then dole them out to the buyers. Um, Lean DNA is can basically perform all those functions um, every time the MRP runs. It it, it can take uh, you know hours or at least our days of work and, and just consolidate it to where when a buyer shows up in the morning they they can give them a very succinct summary. Say yeah, you, know, you have a hundred exception messages. These are the most important ones. These are the five or ten that you can get done today, and this is this is why we picked them. This is the firing order. They're following your strategy, your criticality, um, and and this is the impact they're going to have to your inventory. If you don't cancel this number the one at the top, it's you're going to bring in a whole bunch of uh, material that you don't need, and it's really going to inflate your inventory value. So we we help them kind of eat the elephant. This is kind of how how I would summarize what the Lean DA is, uh, does. Um, that's from the from the buyer perspective. Um, we we've added some new functionality where um, we're really helping and focused on the planner too. So the planner is trying to say, what can I build this week? Um, you know what. Uh, what, what what kits should I pull? What and so they basically go to the warehouse, pull a kit, put it on a cart, push it out to the floor, and say, "Please just assemble this, put this together, machine it, whatever whatever the case is." They need to know what's what's available. 
um, and, and what's going to be coming in just in time to, to support it. So uh, it really helps them then that we have a function called clear to build. And so they, they can go order by order and say, do I have all the material I need? And if they don't, if they're missing one or two components, the, this item will flag up. It's like you have nine of the 10 parts. Here's the one, the one red item, and it allows them to basically chat with, with, uh, with the buyer on that one item for that one order and say, what's the latest? Is this going to come in on time? Should I build it this week or do I need to push my order to next week? And, and uh, so we're, we're really trying to, like I said, f it's really focusing. It, it's, it's, it's taking the data and turning it into actionable, um, uh, focused uh, work that uh, really helps with the, the, the execution, the, the daily execution of, of uh, operations. Uh, and, and, and I mean, what's this doing? Is, is, is your system um, working on, on sort of rules systems or, or like setting up rules or um, is it have its own sort of uh, AI or intelligence to, to improve and, and make this more efficient um, to, to make the recommendations? It, well, it is, it is rules based um, and, and, uh, you know the priority and severity. It's it's all tunable and tailorable. You know based on the customer and and, and what they're requesting. Um, that said, we, we do have some some default logic, and it's all just based on. You know, there, there's nothing really, no magic. It's based on you know su supply chain theory, standard formulas. Um, that said, we we are now starting to monitor. Um, you know how the suggestions are be are they being followed yes or no um, and that that's an exciting area because now w even though we're applying um, you know rules um, th there's always exceptions to the rules so after we we'll, if we feed a buyer multiple um, suggestions and, and they, they're not following it that begs the question hey do we need to apply a new rule um, you're, you're clearly ignoring these we're, we we seem to be missing something, so we don't want to an, uh, annoy people. We're trying to make their life uh, easier. Um, on the flip side, we can also say you are you know we you know, we we've offered we've identified ten opportunities and you've approved them every single time. That gets to the that gets to be very exciting now because now we can say oh you're you're always going to approve these types of messages from this this group of uh, suppliers or, or something um, or with this constraint of time windows or whatever it is that once we identify you know getting dangerously close to 100 percent success rate that's when we can start saying hey let's set up a rule but let's just let's do uh, apply automation here either a put those to the very top of the list because it's just a click yes 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 accept but you know we're, we're at the stage now where we're doing right back to the mrp system towards like Go ahead and, and, and uh, you know write back the information to your MRP and, and, and actually take the action. So that's I think a critical stage. Um, there's all this talk of well, all this talk. <laughs> People, everyone's excited about artificial intelligence, um, and we're um, and it's great. I, I'm, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, that said, there, there's a lot of steps before you get there. A, you need to have really robust rules uh, within your own system. Um, and kind of Lean DNA is, I think, really helping bridge that gap. We're kind of in the augmented intelligence sector, I would say, to where we're identifying patterns and starting to make suggestions. Um, the idea for us would be that we um, get to the point where uh, routine updates and changes can can be fully automated to where we can say, do you want to automate these types of transactions, allowing the buyers to to manage far more parts and really just um, boiling up and, and the, what's going to show up on their list are these are things that you've identified as exceptions. These are unique situations, and and you've you've actually asked me to bring these to you, and, and it's because it's a judgment call. You need to call somebody or um, you know uh, you know potentially look, look at some uh, additional data that's maybe outside the MRP system to, to, to make a call. Um, so, and that's, so, like I said, so identifying the rules and then getting into the augmented intelligence phase. Once you get there and you've boiled it down to a buyer managing exceptions, um, now you've kind of laid the foundation, I would say, for artificial intelligence. Um, but, but that that's a ways away because um, you know in, unless the upstream and downstream customers are also kind of at the same maturity level, um, 
I don't know exactly how, how the AI could make those judgment calls. You know, um, they're, they're going to need data often that's outside um, out, outside the, the the data set they have currently. Um, so they're, they're going to need, uh, you know, their upstream and downstream are also going to need to be kind of at that same level of maturity to fully automate it. So I think uh, you're going to have buyers managing exceptions for, for, for a long time, but they're going to be true exceptions. They're not going to be this rote, just, I need to move something three or four days here, update a PO. Um, yeah, that, I think that's, um, you know, that, that, that level of work can truly can and should be automated. Gotcha, gotcha. So, uh, in in that sense, as, as well as it helping you with the with the planning and 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 sort of following through the recommendations, um, does it sort of follow along um, some bits of that sort of visual management? I mean, is it are there reports and and visualizations and, and being able to go back and see how well did we do last month as well? Um, uh, does it have that side too? Definitely, and that's one one area that's remarkably frustrating in, in current MRP systems is they're very good at showing you, you know, what, what's happening today, what do I need to do today, but um, something as simple as recurring shortages, like how frequently has this part been short over the past, you know, six months, 12 months, um, what was the average, uh, you know, the count, the, the depth of delay, you know, how, how many days was it short, or, or how extreme, uh, how, what was the quantity, um, you know, some of these very simple things um, are, are often become a little bit of a science project. It's not that the data doesn't exist. It's just you often have to kind of click back through history. And unfortunately, a lot of the systems do not make that easy. Um, so that's one advantage that, you know, LeanDNA has definitely recognized and we're helping, uh, you know, feed, feed that up and provide these uh, really just some, some common metrics that really help people make, make better decisions and, and understand where are their pain points and, um, and to, you know, kind of take, you know, there, there's always that, that, that freak, uh, I guess, uh, the, the bias to, to things that are, you know, the most current I- issue. So by helping spread that out, um, that definitely helps with the, uh, the and that's, I think that's one of the reasons why you see uh, poor applications of strategic inventory and safety stock is you have this, uh, you know, this, this bias of, of the most recent event. Um, and and people often uh, aren't looking at it holistically and, and kind of uh, re- remembering everything that occurred over the past uh, year. So sort of looking looking at this as a whole and, and where you're trying to um, solve with with lean DNA or improve for people. Um, if if there is that chasm of um, uh, of improvement or capacity or understanding in in supply chain um, with with SMEs. Um, what is it that you feel is it is it is it a people a process a technology um problem that that you are helping them make that leap um or is it all three i mean where, where where's that that jump forward that that you feel that it's uh, best solving i think it's really uh, and i think the goal should be to to really elevate the the buyer um unfortunately um a lot of people, you know, be, become a buyer with the idea that they're going to be uh, a lot more strategic. That they're going to be, you know, identifying sources, negotiating contracts, and and, and doing. Um, th- th- I think in people's minds, that's that's kind of what they think a buyer is. Un- unfortunately, the reality hits when a lot of them end up at a at a manufacturing site, and it's just transactional based. It's that those exception messages that came up, and it's it's rebalancing supply and demand. And it's very um, repetitive. It it never ends. Every day there's a new crisis, and uh, there's a lot of turnover, a lot of burnout. Um, and it's you know we're really using people f- um, to to just perform simple transactions that, that that should be automated. So the idea with with uh, Lean DNA and, and these tools is to a make it a lot easier, a lot faster to, to, to um, identify where they need to focus their attention and B, really start trying to elevate them from being a, um, you know, just focusing on, on daily transactions and trying to be more strategic. You know, instead of constantly reallocating things uh, or, or, or adapting to disruptions, creating supply chains that are that are agile and that uh, you know say oh I, I have this sort of demand signal 
I can't plan on perfection. So many MRP systems and strategies are just planning on a perfect upstream and downstream customer. And then as soon as there's any minor disruption, exception messages, the, the thing lights up like a Christmas tree. You know, you, you really, uh, if a Buyers need the time, though, to, to monitor the data and say, oh, I'm, I'm having this sort of variability. This is a, an order policy. This is a strategic inventory strategy that will self-correct and, ad- and adapt to this. Um, and then, then you're really you're solving a problem. You know, you're, you're creating a, um, you know, you're balancing, creating a, a, a supply signal that can uh, adapt to very variations in demand. I think though that's the type of work that, that's value-added. Um, and, and, and you're really solving a problem and I think would be rewarding. If, if you just show up every day and say, I plan for perfection and yesterday wasn't a perfect day, therefore I have all these errors that I need to correct. That's, I think it's, it's, it's infuriating. And I, I think that's what leads to you know, a, lot, a lot of burnout. Um, so by offering them, the, by providing them the, the, the data they need and the visibility um, and, and the, the ability to, to develop these plans to, to to really solve a problem as opposed to just react to it. Uh, I think that's where uh, I see Lean DNA's uh, uh, a huge benefit you know, in, in both uh, buyer retention and also um, them being a lot more uh, effective. Oh, I can, yeah, no, I can certainly see as a, as a buyer being able to just reduce, reduce that noise or that level of panic or just that, that, that list of growing uh, tickets or emails or <laughs> things in the ARP that um, people have got issues that you've just got to connect up, that you've just got to tidy up and, and, uh, and get them playing in the right, right way or uh, solve or <laughs> reshuffle for the next day, um, move, move that forward. No, that, that that's great. And and do you think that's that's the the next challenge for the next few years is 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 going to be um we'll we'll get through that or, or people will are slowly going to have moved to this pattern uh, and we can move forward uh, with with it being more of a planning phase. Definitely, yeah. I, I think um, by by people being able to to develop um, uh, you know plans and 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 and, and policies that that, that self adapt and and you know recognize. What is normal? What, what's normal variation? I mean, you know, there's always going to be exceptions. I mean, you can't plan for for everything. But right now, unfortunately, too many places plan for nothing. And you know, like I said, just every day plan for perfection. The, no, the manufacturing is never going to scrap a part. The supplier is never going to pull in an order. Our I'm sorry, our customer is never going to pull in an order or something. Um, so yeah, by by developing those plans, that's the first step, you know, um, in, in getting us towards this, this AI uh, vision in, in the future to where once you have those, uh, a plan for every part that does its best to balance all, all the cost and, and risk associated um, from, like I said, from uh, manufacturing to inventory carrying costs to logistics to everything. Once you say, this is the best plan for this part, um, you know, a it, it it should protect you. It should minimize these uh, you know exceptions and, and and disconnects. And from there, yeah. Now now you like I said, now now you have the foundation to say, okay, now what portions of these am I so confident in, or did I have the fidelity in that I I can truly automate? And then you just slowly start. It, it it will it will get to the point where you have to have more and more complications uh, to to address. Um, the, the, as you start draining the pond, this, a lot of the easy ones will, you know, the um, your your C parts, your your fasteners, nuts and bolts. So those are already very very simple and, and easy to to manage. Um, but you know, as you start getting into the, the more complex um, assemblies and, and and proprietary or, or unique um, uh, items with 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 one with maybe single sources and whatnot, those those will become um, Will, will be the challenges that you'll have to solve at the end. No, I think that's a that's a, that's a good vision to 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 have stepped up and uh, uh, raised, raised above that that day to day of just just noise and battling. Um, no, but that, that, I think that's great, and I think that's a, a great way to, to to leave that point for for now on on that side. Um, maybe move into to some of these sort of more uh, final personal questions as we come to the to the end of the interview. Um, as you've taken us on a good journey of where we might be able to go and 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 improve this um, uh, the 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 buyer's role. 
so uh, our other closing question, um, which I guess you've, you've sort of um, dug into a little bit just just there is, um, but maybe we could take it up that, that extra level. If we were going to give you superhuman powers, um, either for yourself or, or you might put it in the hands of, uh, of a buyer um, to, to, to make that leap forwards, um, sort of the technology aside, what would be the things that they could grab or their superpowers um, that might help them move forward? Um. I think a lot of it comes down to, I'd say maybe X-ray vision or or, or the ability to, to see up and down the supply chain. Um, there's, um, you know, there's everyone has you know business uh, constraints and and then they they uh, you know have have to preserve some uh, opaque. You know, they can't be completely transparent. Um, it does cost everybody though in the supply chain um, the, the the inability to see. Uh, bottlenecks and and and, and, and excess material um, the the ability to see f- uh, up and down from from your raw material supplier all the way to the final assembly having that visibility um, would be would be so, such an advantage um, what it really when you look in a supply chain there's an optimal place to put your strategic inventory it's often not um, at the exact raw material, not the guy digging the ore out of the earth um, for a steel part, um, but it's typically somewhere in between that and the finished goods. It's some sort of uh, semi-finished or uh, level that, that's the optimal level, and that. So the the challenge though would be that uh, your 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 optimum strategic inventory position might be that yes, I'm going to hold on to the fasteners, but I'm. This uh, this machined forging is very expensive, but the forging itself maybe isn't that expensive and has a very long lead time. So I really need to hold on to forgings and fasteners and other various components. So you'd really want to kind of be able to distribute uh, your your strategic inventory throughout the supply chain, and that's is often difficult to see and um, and to have the transparency and pricing and everything to really understand um, all, all the value added steps and where where where's the right balance to to, to kind of put the the optimal buffers in a supply chain to, to protect you from disruption no, those are those are solid answers, and uh, uh, definitely uh, ones that I'm sure many people would like to be able to to to, to grasp and and take on. Um, no, that's that's great. Um, no, it's been been great talking to you today and uh, and and dipping into to your your wealth of knowledge around this area. Um, I, I wonder uh, if if you got a particular um, sort of target market or uh, people you're you're looking to to work with, or how they can best get in contact with yourself or um, come and see this software. Definitely. I mean, we. I think we we've worked with. Um, I think any large to medium uh, ma- manufacturer. Uh, you know, as you increase the number of parts, you increase the number of exception messages when you're trying to build assemblies. So we we do add. We are we increase our value as as the part count goes up. Um, and, but uh, you know, we have customers large and small. Um, and you can definitely learn more by visiting our website at www.leandna.com. Perfect, perfect. Um, I'll be uh, be right along and uh, and checking this out and um, yeah, raising all our uh, quality and our, <laughs> our supply chain buyers. Um, that's been great. Well, thanks very much for joining us again today, Harrison. Um, uh, and I look forward to speaking to you again. Yes, that's great. Nice meeting you, Tristan. Thanks for joining us again today in the Cliff Notes podcast. We've taken a journey and we've got to the end. So what we'd like to hear is hear back from you. So please feel free to uh, reach out to us uh, on the website, cliffnotespodcast.com or on all the social medias. Um, or give us a, a like and a review in your um, podcast player. Thank you and we we'll look forward to speaking to you again soon.